Okay, hi everybody. Um, so again, my name is Greg Bayless. Um, today I'll be talking a little bit about how we can use games for different purposes than just entertainment and how, in fact, games can actually make us whole, both in a physical sense, in a mental sense, um, in a community sense, um, things like that. Um, so again, my name is Greg. Uh, I like games, I like people, uh, and I try to bring those things together in all of my work. Um, I, I sort of am an interactive artist masquerading as a game designer, masquerading as a project manager, okay? So, um, so my days, oh, I'll move ahead, sorry. My, my days are actually spent um, as a project manager at the University of Utah. I work in the Therapeutic Games and Apps Lab. And so we, uh, we create all sorts of games for medical, therapeutic, rehabilitative, educational, and serious purposes. So I'm kind of harnessing the power of games to be able to do cool things. So everything from um, creating apps to help you take your medications on time, to um, projecting virtual limbs onto amputation points for people with phantom limb pain, um, to everything in between. So really, blue sky. Um, my road to games, though, has been kind of a, a long path. I went to a little school down in Provo, Utah, um, called BYU. I was an English major. Um, but I started out in chemistry and then had a foray into Russian folklore and translation and stuff like that. Um, ended up in English, did a master's degree then in video game design and, and then somehow ended up uh, in medical games at the end of it. So it's been kind of a weird journey, but I think everyone sort of has a, you know, a similar story. <laughs> you never know where you're going to end up. Um, I uh, am also a small business owner, so I have a company called Gauche Games, um, and I do all sorts of sort of queer, uh, silly stories. Um, I do some mildly political stuff, um, and mostly I just like getting people together. So it's not, I mean, it's not something I'm gonna make bank off of. Um, it's mostly uh, an excuse for me to get other people playing my games. Um, and I have one later today that we'll get to play a little bit. Um, but again, it kind of focuses on funny experiences like, you know, uh, hillbilly houses turning into mechs and things like that. Um, how can you go wrong with something like that, right? Um, I uh, also recently founded a games collective called The Salt Works. Um, and recently our, our efforts have been focused on building arcade cabinets and, and then actually making the games for the arcades. Um, but anyway, so if that's something that's of interest to you, talk to me afterwards, because um, there are all sorts of games creatives in Salt Lake doing really interesting things. We focus specifically on indie, but there are um, groups more around the business of games and around project management, and there are arts collectives that focus on game art or procedural art, so that's, that's also an avenue that you can explore. Um, as you might have guessed, today we have the uh, awesome talk topic of games, and so I wanted to lead out with uh, Boris Johnson's thoughts on games. Uh, back in 2006, he said that games essentially reduced children to leaping and zapping in speechless rapture, their passive faces washed in explosions and gore. They sit for so long that their souls have been sucked down the cathode ray tube um, because we still used cathode ray tubes. <laughs> um, yeah, how far we've come in <laughs> just a short amount of time. Um, I'm glad to say that uh, Boris Johnson's years were uh, a, a little bit exaggerated, and that in fact games are doing wonderful things for people. Um, to start out though, I wanted to kind of define for you guys what a game really is. Understanding, with the ca caveat that this is a conversation that is ongoing, and there will be a thousand people who argue with my definition of a game, but I figure I've been in the industry a long enough time that I can have an opinion on this. So. Uh, I'm going to, to make this, uh, this statement today that a game is simply a combination of rules or systems and feedback or interaction. 
So you have rules that you define, and then you have some way for the machine or for another player or, or something like that to give you feedback on what you're doing. So sometimes, you know, for example, if you're playing games uh, as kids, you know, the, the rules are sort of free form. You're thinking them up as you're going, and then the feedback is saying, hey, you can't do that, or, you know, hey, that's mine, you know. In, in video games, we, we think we have more... Uh, I guess, objective rules that, that everyone is subject to um, and everyone has to sort of obey them. But um, this fundamental understanding of what a game is will really influence um, the, the conversation that we have around games. Um, the problem is there's also lots of rules outside of games that sort of govern how games interact with humans and how humans interact with games. So some of some common ones that we've seen before, you know, women don't play games. Games are only for young people. Um, all video games are violent, or they cause violence. Um, what are some What are some other things that you've maybe heard about games? What are some other meta rules of games? Sure. Games are a waste of time. Games are a waste of time. Okay, perfect. Games are addictive. I mean, maybe that's true. <laughs> I mean, some addictions aren't so bad. <laughs> yeah. Games make you dumb. Okay. Games are antisocial. Yeah. Any others? Sedentary. How about that? Video games are sedentary. I mean, you have sort of that Boris Johnson ideal of of someone hunched over in front of a screen in a basement. You know, um, their their soul draining down <laughs> into the cathode ray tube. Um, you know the. It's not a sport. It's not a sport. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. No, that's great. And um, beyond that, there are rules or myths around the people who can play games. Okay. So, so for example, people with spinal with spinal cord injuries can't play sports or or can't engage in certain games. Um, physical or mental differences are disabilities or weaknesses rather than strengths. You know, so these are myths that govern the way that we interact with technology. You know, uh, the, the clear reality is people with spinal cord injuries can participate in sports. It's, it's just a different experience, you know. So I'll talk a little bit more about this, but what you're seeing on the left here is a ski chair that the University of Utah developed. We developed a simulator for it and a, a set of controllers as well that allows a person with full spinal cord injury, so like from the neck down even, to be able to control this ski chair using just their mouth. Um, so they can literally ski down the mountain after training on our simulator, of course. <laughs> and, and with the coach there, you know, just in case something goes awry, they can literally ski down a mountain unassisted. Um, we've done the same thing with a, uh, like a sailboat, essentially, a, a big kayak, where someone who's literally on a respirator um, can get into this sailboat unassisted and using just a sip and puff controller, um, control the sailboat. Uh, or, or any combination of controllers. You'll see here, this is one with a joystick on it, but the, the controller that we've written as, as part of our program uh, allows you to combine those inputs. So joystick plus sip and puff, or tongue depressors, or muscle readers that, that sense the, the twitching of your muscle in your arm, you know, all sorts of things. So essentially, whatever the person comes to the table with, we're able to use that to be able to uh, allow them to participate in something that otherwise wouldn't be possible. Um, I want to touch on this again, though. Um, the idea that physical or mental differences are not necessarily disabilities. We have this idea that, you know, oh, if someone has autism spectrum disorder, that's a disability. Well, what would a game be like where that was actually an advantage? You know, most people think that autism is a social disorder, but actually it's a, it's a sensory difference. It's that they perceive the world differently. So what does, what does a game for um, people with autism look like? And, and how can we use autism as a strength rather than as a, you know, as sort of a disability that we're trying to accommodate for? Um, so I guess kind of the, the big point that I'm trying to get to is that there's lots of rules surrounding games and surrounding, you know, pretty much any creative medium. Uh, and one of the biggest ways that we can uh, kind of get to a, a true creative place is by breaking all the rules. You know, by throwing out our initial assumptions about 
who can do a thing and where they're supposed to do it and for what purposes and things like that. Um, and so a lot of the work that we do as part of the Therapeutic Games and Apps Lab um, is sort of reassessing who can play games and for what reasons. Um, and so I want to give you just kind of a, oops, um, just kind of a quick idea of what we do. Oh, how does this work? Oh, okay. Um, so this is, ooh. Oh, I broke it. <laughs> with the classiest music ever, right? Um, so again, this is that ski chair. Um, we built a simulator that goes with it, so they train on actual slopes. So these, this is based on geo uh, sorry. Um, that, so those levels. <laughs> so uh, those levels that you saw are, uh, are based on actual ski slopes around here. So it's literally the same mountains that people will be skiing on. They train in the simulator, and then they're able to go, go out and actually try it. Um, this is, again, that, that sailboat. When we originally built it, you had to hoist the sail. You had to have someone hoisting the sails. Now it's all completely mechanized. So, um, so someone with a complete disability can, can go ahead and do it. We've used games for all sorts of things like trainings and, uh, and simulations. So this is for IV placement for the College of Nursing at the University of Utah. Um, they didn't have any sort of standard curriculum, and so we developed that. Um, this is a medication management app that we developed. It actually, let me turn this down a little bit. Um, so it actually integrates with your electronic medical records pulls your medication info and lets you set reminders and stuff based on that. But it's, you, you don't have to really set anything. It just auto-populates all that information. Um, this is some work that we've done with amputations. So uh, it uses a muscle reader in the upper, upper arm to be able to um, essentially create gestures. So you saw it with someone who has, has an arm, and we were sort of projecting a virtual limb on top of that. But um, people without the arm can, can control this virtual limb using just the, the extant muscles in their upper arm. Um, this is a, a simulator that we built for uh, body dysmorphic disorder. So um, there are some people who have a different perception of what their body looks like than what it actually looks like. They might think that they're fat when, in fact, they're very skinny. Um, they might think that they are uh, you know, average-sized when, in fact, they have huge, gigantic muscles and things like that. So uh, we kind of worked with that. Um, this is a game that I'll talk a little bit more about later, but it was designed with and for children with autism. So we brought them in as co-designers on this game. Um, and it is basically an underwater choreography game. So using pattern thinking um, to be able to reduce state and trait anxiety. And that's based on the research of Temple Grandin, who does a lot in uh, autism and pattern thinking. Oh, and that's our boomerang shark, because why not? <laughs> um, this is one that we developed with the Museum of Natural History. It's called Dino Lab, and it's a critical thinking game for uh, kids between the ages of about 10 and 14. Uh, and so what they're doing is going through and building their own dinosaur based on different metrics. Um, they can put all sorts of different bones together. We give them sort of tasks that they're trying to accomplish. Uh, like it needs to be able to outrun prey. It needs to be able to get a certain amount of food. And then it decides whether that was a, a good fit or not. Um, I think this is the last one in the series, but this is a, a sort of a diabetes game. It's in virtual reality, so you might see that. You might also see some obscuring of the vision on that last section. Let's see if I can rewind a little bit, sorry. Um, so what you're actually seeing there is a simulation of diabetic eye disease. So we figured what better way to teach people about eye disease than to actually simulate, oh, sorry than to actually simulate eye disease in a virtual reality setting. And so you'll see sort of some dark patches over, um, you know, over your vision. It should show up in just a sec. See those dark patches there? So that, that's what it would be like if you had actual diabetic eye disease. And so we sort of simulate that experience to get people to care about their health. This is another interesting thing. Um, and I'll talk more about this later, but this is someone's 
um, blood glucose curve turned into a physical mountain that they can travel to the peaks and valleys of. And so it's kind of a way of, of understanding their health data in a, in a different way, you know? Um, okay. So there were a lot of ideas that I touched on in that, and I'm going to go into more detail on, on some of them. So don't worry if, like, if, if it seemed like I was maybe rushing through, because I absolutely was. Um, I swear I know how to go to the next slide. Okay, um, but one of the big ways that we can sort of throw away all the rules of what we knew before is by embracing what we call participatory design. Um, and so that means not only bringing in subject matter experts and, uh, and designers and people like that, but also bringing in the actual people who are going to be using the apps or, or the games or um, bringing in the end user, essentially. You know? So if, if you're a writer, that means bringing in potential readers and talking to them and finding out what's interesting and important to them. Um, for game developers, that means, you know, if we're developing an app for children, that means bringing in the, both the children and their parents and their teachers and sort of everyone who might be able to offer valuable insights into, um, you know, what would make for a su successful experience. Um, if, if you've ever studied the business model canvas, um, it talks a lot about, you know, getting stakeholder buy-in, essentially. Um, but with creative things, it's, it's more than just, you know, stakeholders like uh, a producer or some, someone like that. It's also the, the people who are um, sort of, you know, buying the books for their kids, you know, or uh, in the case of medical games, it's the doctors who are going to be allowing or not allowing the games to be played in their clinic. Um, so there's this uh, funny example of, uh, a, a cancer game, it's called Remission, they spent millions of dollars building it, they clinically validated it, they got tons of um, you know, press for it and everything. When the time came to actually deploy it in hospitals, they went to administrators and said, hey, we have this awesome game, it's, it's clinically validated, it proves, or, you know, we've, we've proven it's effective in doing this, this, and this, it's already built, and, and doctors said, nope, sorry, we're not gonna distribute it because they had uh, built a game with a sexualized main character and it was violent and you know just all these things that like essentially made it so it couldn't be you know reasonably played in a hospital parents didn't want their kids playing it cuz again it had a, a sexualized main character um, and so sort of participatory design means getting all the information on the table getting you know everyone possible there in a room <laughs> Uh, and, and kind of figuring out what those barriers are, are actually going to be ahead of time. Um, we had kind of an interesting experience in our lab with a game called, well, we call it PE game, but it's essentially patient empowerment. It was a game for uh, kids with cancer, and they essentially they needed to get some sort of aerobic exercise. And so we used the, uh, the Wii controllers to get them moving around and things like that. Um, when we actually asked them um, you know, well, so our initial kind of idea was, oh, we'll make the kids superheroes, we'll have them, like, fighting crime, that kind of thing. And when we actually went and talked to these kids, um, you know, they were about fourth grade, something like that, and we said, what, what kinds of experiences are interesting to you? And we expected them to say, you know, like, beating stuff up and um, playing sports and things like that. And oddly enough, they said, throwing away garbage. <laughs> and we said, what? That doesn't make any sense, you know? Um, like, it, that sounds like the most boring and mundane thing ever. But see, the thing is, all of their, um, all of their peers in school at that time were learning about recycling and about garbage. And because they are cancer patients, they uh, are immunocompromised, they're not allowed near anything like that. And so all of their peers had been learning about garbage and throwing things in the recycling bins, and all these kids wanted was to feel that experience, you know? And so we literally built a game about sorting garbage and recycling, and it was, it was super successful with this specific population because we listened. 
you know, because we got all the information on the table. And, and mind you, that's not something we would have ever thought of, you know. It's not like we walked away from that meeting saying like, oh man, we were, you know, we were super smart to make a garbage game, <laughs> you know. We, we had no idea. Um, but because we were willing to listen and because we were willing to embrace that idea of participatory design, um, we ended up creating, creating an experience that was really meaningful for these kids and accomplished that end goal of getting them to exercise and move around. Um, another, uh, well, you saw this a little bit earlier, but this is another game where we brought in the, uh, the end user as co-designers. So again, this is a, a game for kids with autism. It uses pattern thinking and pattern creation as a way to soothe anxiety. Um, but you know, probably 70% of the, the features of this game actually came because the, the kids suggested them themselves. So everything from the, uh, the color schemes to the content to the controller design to, um, you know, like the, the music, you know, all sorts of things were, uh, were defined because we actually talked to the kids. We got autism experts and autism educators and kids with autism in the room. Um, we had, those same kids with autism come back and play the game as we're developing it and say, oh no, this isn't gonna work and this will. And, and thankfully, like a lot of times when we have play testers come in, um, especially early on, they have this sort of binary response. They're like, oh, I like it or, oh, I don't like it. You know, and as developers, that's not super useful. I mean, it's, it's good to have perspectives, but, um, but it doesn't actually give us very much information. But that's, uh, that's somewhere where uh, having playtesters with, with autism was actually a huge benefit because they were brutally honest about, <laughs> about the things that they liked or didn't like. You know, if they thought something was stupid, they would just say, this is stupid, I don't like it, <laughs> get rid of it, you know? And so we were able to fail fast, essentially. That's a kind of a game design mantra, is you wanna fail fast. Make, make as many mistakes as you can early on so that you can get to the right answers quickly. Um, but I feel like that's something that you can this is like showing all sorts of weird things. <laughs> I guess, yeah. Um, um, the, the next idea that I wanted to, to move into is the idea of the magic circle. So there's a game scholar called Huizinga, and he basically talks about the magic circle as this sort of imaginary line that we draw when we play. So. Uh, when you're playing tag, you enter the magic circle, you understand that tag is a game where you're not hitting each other, uh, where you're not you know, uh, trying to shove the other kid's face into the mud. It, it, there are certain rules that govern play, there are certain spaces that govern that play. You know, you know if you're playing tag that running into traffic is not, <laughs> is not a, an okay option. Um, and, and essentially the game begins when everyone decides that they're they're going to play, you know? So there's this sort of mutual suspension of disbelief, there's this mutual adoption of rules that happens. Um, and one of the ways that we can sort of tap into creativity is by breaking the circle. There are different ways about going, uh, going about that though. So um, when I was a kid, my brothers and I loved to play Risk and my older brother was undefeated at risk. And granted, he was good at risk, but the reason he was undefeated wasn't because he was really good at risk, it was because somehow, anytime he was losing, a nuclear explosion would destroy the game board. You know, I, I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but you know, he, he's falling behind and suddenly, oh no, all the pieces are everywhere, and how did that happen, you know? So that's, that's an example of breaking the magic circle in a way that's unproductive. You know, where everyone gets angry, it, uh, it kind of throws you out of the game uh, abruptly, you know, without, <laughs> without really wanting to. A different way of breaking the circle, though, is actually by broadening its, uh, its reach. So you see that with games like Pokemon Go, where uh, suddenly ordinary, you know, streets or cul-de-sacs or parks are, are suddenly now magical, mystical worlds where there are wild creatures and you're meeting strangers just randomly and you're, you're exploring all over the place. And so, I mean, essentially this game renewed the magic circle for a lot of people. It said, hey, wait, this, this ordinary mundane world all around you is actually something beautiful and magical and 
by the way, these are people, you might not have seen them in a while because you've been in your basement, like, you know, draining down the cathode ray tube, but, um, but look, there's people all around you who have similar interests and similar ideas as you. Um, and so kind of, you know, breaking that magic circle uh, in the sense that we're like growing the, uh, the edges of its boundaries, you know, letting more people in. Again, it's that idea of uh, breaking the rules of who's allowed to play and where it happens and for what purposes and at what times, you know, um, with rehab, for example, a lot of um, a lot of times with kids, rehab is geared around play. But suddenly you turn 18, and rehab is now you know do do 10 exercises 10 times a day, and you only have 100 things to to remember. So I don't know why you're complaining, you know. And they're all boring, and there's probably a manual somewhere with checklists and stuff like that. I mean, with kids, you just tell them to play, you know. And so like, why? Why are we embracing this workful uh, ideology uh, uh, for rehab when in actuality play is more effective and more engaging and, and you know, just all around better? Um, that kind of brings me to my next big point, which is that we can tap into creativity with games by re-embodying play. So um, if you think about kind of your earliest experiences with play, um, tag or playing in the backyard or, you know, or hiking or wh whatever, like those are all embodied experiences. Um, and a lot of video games have kind of gone in the direction of, you know, the, the Boris Johnson ideal of sitting there with your controller hunched shoulders. Um, but that doesn't have to be the reality. And in fact, we'll find that, um, Situations where we're using the body are actually going to help people learn faster and be happier and be more engaged um, in their reality. Um, this is kind of a weird thought, but your whole body is a brain. So a lot of times we like to think about learning as a cerebral process that happens up here, but the reality is that our brain doesn't, doesn't know anything without our senses. You know, If it can't hear and taste and touch, um, then it has no information to process. And so essentially, like, if, if our whole body is a brain, then we can only uh, improve the kind of the quality of our learning, the quality of our rehabilitation um, by engaging more of those senses. Um, there's, there's been a lot of studies on sort of how games can actually stimulate growth and, uh, and things like that. But I wanted to just touch upon a few basic ideas. First off, um, it's been shown that playing video games actually causes increased neurogenesis. So that's creation of neurons in your brain, which is a, a pretty cool thing. That's most specifically, again, in these areas, spatial navigation, memory, strategic, uh, strategic planning, and fine motor control. But it turns out those are essential things for a lot more than just playing video games, you know? It turns out that being able to write is based on your fine motor control, or being able to plan strategically is necessary for you to be able to plan your retirement or, or your future career, or, or whatever it may be. And so again, um, playing video games increases neurogenesis, uh, increases brain connectivity. That notion of increased connectivity is super, super important because that actually aids in uh, long-term, uh, essentially, uh, learning potential. So the, the increased connection between the cerebrum and the cerebellum means that you retain information for longer, you integrate it more fully into uh, kind of your, your workflow, uh, and you're better able to use it in, in your day-to-day -day life. Um, we've used video games, uh, you know, again, for a number of things, but one of our most recent projects is uh, a sort of a trainer for social workers, of all things. So we worked with the Department of Child and Family Services at the University of Utah. Usually when they go to uh, train for home visits for like child protective services and things like that, they have to trash a house. So it takes all day to trash a house and then they have people go through one by one and sort of identify protective measures and risk factors in the house. And it's hugely expensive and hugely inefficient. And so what we did is we went through and created sort of a virtual experience of a trashed house. And you'll see here kind of what that looks like. Um, so 
uh, we're actually engaging people by having them do the thing that, the, that they're, they're supposed to be training for. So this, this is 360 degree photo photography inside of a trashed house. Um, this can be done on Google Cardboard or on the Oculus Rift. So it's something that someone could take home and practice different levels. Um, you know, they go through, they take pictures of different risk factors or protective measures. They can add notes. They can, um, you know, they can record audio with it. Um, but this has been super successful in terms of being able to help people actually learn how to do a home visit in a way that is sort of safe, where they feel comfortable making mistakes because it's not you're not impacting some child's life. Um, <laughs> like, I mean, that sounds funny, but like a lot of the education that happens both in, um, you know, social work and in medicine is, is pretty minimal. Um, most doctors, for example, on procedures, the, the way that they become certified in a procedure is they watch one, watch one procedure, they do a procedure, and then they teach a procedure. And that's like, that's the extent of it, <laughs> and so, I, know, I mean, trust your doctors, they're competent and, and stuff like that, but there are, there are better ways that we can educate people than just by having them do a, a procedure once or twice and then talk about it, you know? They can literally go through all of these, um, you know, through simulators, they can do uh, virtual reality, whatever, you know? Uh, and it's just going to sort of increase their potential to to understand things and uh, lock them down in memory. Um, one of the ways that we've sort of tried to, um, sorry, oh, so again, bringing the body back into, back into training, like we're literally putting them inside of a virtual reality environment. Um, that's, that's a good step, but it's not, it's, it's not a final step. It's, it still leaves out a lot of the body. It's essentially just a screen attached to your face. And so one of the directions that we've been going recently is in integrating things like fitness track trackers and biometrics, like um, your blood glucose levels from a glucometer, um, things like that, actually integrating them into the game. Um, so think about, a, we developed a game, for example, that was supposed to um, help people manage stress, and the way it did that is it would read your stress levels, and then it would try to stress you out. <laughs> so it, it's a little bit sadistic in the sense that we're literally using your body against you, but um, but essentially it would it would read your skin conductivity, um, your heart rate, your respiration, and then it would find the things that stressed you out the most and do more of that. <laughs> so again, kind of kind of sadistic, but also. Yeah, also kind of amazing. Um, so, oops. So I talked about this one earlier, but this is a, a game for diabetes. Um, oh, and I'm actually going to skip ahead because there's a lot of stuff. Um, maybe I'll skip ahead. Um, but like I was talking about earlier, this is someone's actual blood glucose. Um, curve from their electronic medical records and they're able to travel to different points of, of that mountain um, and understand that data in a way that is completely different than just looking at a chart you know so a lot of times we, we think about health data and it's a number and we don't understand what the number means and it's a graph and we don't know what the graph means you know it, it's essentially disembodied information that has everything to do with our bodies and so the idea here was how can we bring the body back into the, the health experience? You know, maybe it's not uh, in the exact way that, uh, you know, that, that it's measured. These are the weirdest pictures ever. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, you know, so the, the physical affect of having to look up at your blood glucose curve um, creates a visceral reaction in the body. You know, how do we bring back those physical experiences uh, of embodied health. Um, another way that we've tried to do that is by actually bringing the body into games. So, oops. Um, so this is a game that we are actually currently working on. It's called Virtual Limb, and again, it's for phantom limb pain, and uh, essentially for amputees. But you'll see here, we're using trackers 
to, um, to track people's legs and arms inside of the game world. So this is kind of a combination piece where there's a, a patient who's playing inside of the game, and then there's a clinician who's putting down different tasks for the patient to do in live time. So here we have blocks that you have to arrange in different orders. Um, here we have sort of stretching exercises where you have to bring your leg up to a, a certain point. Um, but kind of bringing the actual human body into, into the game so that you can see it and interact with it, um, it's, a, it's a big step, and I think we're going to see a lot more of stuff like this. Like the technology has, has come a long way just in a few years, um, but we're excited about the possibilities. And again, we're using the, the myoelectric band, so what you're seeing is a, essentially a, a muscle signal reader on the upper arm that takes those electrical inputs and turns them into a gesture in the actual game. Um, so we get to do something fun here in just a sec. Um, but I mean, so one way of, of sort of bringing the body back into play is by putting the body into games. But another way is by bringing games into the real world. So a lot of times games are focused sort of in the computer or on the console or on your phone. Um, the Makey Makey is a, a device, I, I have one here today that I'll kind of show off, but it essentially turns anything into a controller. So everything from a banana to a kiwi to a tulip, um, it becomes a controller that you can use for the game. And so it's, it's much more rooted in physical objects. Um, and today uh, I have a game that I want to demo for you guys. So um, I developed a game uh, probably six months ago. It was a super tiny game called Pause Fab, and it was for the World AIDS Day uh, celebration at the, at the Pride Center. But the, the idea that I was going off of was the idea of um, sort of, well, so during the AIDS crisis, they had what were called kiss-ins, and it was essentially uh, like people would just kiss in public um, to show that AIDS wasn't something that could be transmitted through spit or through kissing, you know, that physical contact with another person wasn't going to kill you, that AIDS wasn't something that should be stigmatized. And so I wanted to build off of that by creating physical connection between different people. So touching each other's hands, um, because it was mostly gay men at this event, um, there was also kissing and spanking and stuff like that. So it, it ended up being fun, and everyone was a little bit drunk, so that helped too. <laughs> but um, but it was just really neat because uh, the game itself was was simple. The, I mean, I spent I think six hours developing the game, and it's again it's super simple. There are a thousand similar games like it, um, but the the interesting part was that people kind of brought their own stories and brought their own relationships and, and brought their own uh, boundaries regarding touch and, and physicality, and that became really interesting to witness. So, for example, this was, <laughs> this was one of my favorite um, like couples that came. Um, so I thought that they were a couple. It turned out they were actually exes um, who were getting together for the first time since they had broken up and they just decided to come to this event. It made me wonder whether he had come out as gay or something, and that's why they, that's why they broke up, I'm not sure. But, um, but they had, uh, this was their first time together, and they sort of walked up to me, and I, I, I thought, oh, okay, they're, they're a couple, I can, I can ask them to kiss on the cheek or something like that, and it won't be a big deal at all. And uh, I, I asked that, and immediately I saw like these different reactions in the different people, you know. One was sort of anxious and not knowing, you know, what to think, and the other was excited at the possibility of reconnecting in sort of a fun, playful, public way. Um, you know, and so, again, sort of navigating those, those boundaries became a really interesting experience. Um, I want to actually demo the game for you, because I think it's kind of fun. And so I have two lovely volunteers over here. Um, Let's see. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to turn the volume up. Maybe I won't. Okay. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to have our our friends each hold a controller. So one of you gets one of those, and yeah, and you'll just hold on to the plant or the leaf or whatever. You don't have to touch the wires at all. Essentially, what we're doing is we're creating a circuit. 
Okay, so each of them has one end of the circuit and anytime they make skin contact, it's going to complete that circuit and register it as a button press um, once I plug it in. Um, but anyway, so anytime they touch skin, um, we're gonna see our character jump. And so let's try it out, try touching. <laughs> okay, here, let's do claps so we can hear when it happens. Oh, so clap to start. Oh, yep, okay. sorry. No! That was <laughs> it's, <laughs> too soon. Let's try again. I got excited. I got excited. Okay. Oh, why is it lagging? Go! Go again! Sorry. <laughs> I think that was the computer's fault. Sorry, it started lagging for some reason. Okay, let's try one more time. You got it this time, I'm sure. Oh no! <laughs> Perfect. That's that's great to start off with. Okay, so um, so oh, <laughs> we're breaking everything. Um, so I'll have that up afterwards if people want to try it out. It's kind of fun to to be able to do stuff. But um, the the big point is like uh, out of out of that whole experience, it wasn't that people walked away. Oops. Uh, it wasn't that people walked away from that experience saying, oh, that game was so cool. Like, the, the experiences that they remembered and that I remembered were those experiences of sort of closeness and navigating boundaries and, uh, oh, remember when he did this? Remember when she did that? You know, it was all about people. And suddenly it was less about the game and it was more about what was going on between the people. And so that... Um, that for me was a huge win, you know, where, where it's essentially uh, taking play and, and helping people remember that play is a human thing, um, that play is, a, is an experience that you have with another person. You know, a lot of times with games, for example, we, we don't think of it as a human social interaction, but the reality is that behind the code and behind, behind their artwork, there is some, you know, brilliant artist or brilliant coder or some group of 300 brilliant, brilliant, brilliant artists and coders who have put their souls into, into that experience. And so sometimes it helps just to sort of have that reminder that, oh, play is a human experience. Like what I'm experiencing when I'm playing a game is a, uh, an asynchronous social experience with the, with the designers and creators. Um, each individual person brings personal stories to their experiences with play. How are we on time? Okay, okay, yeah, I've got like four minutes, is that okay? Or should, okay. Uh, okay, yeah, sorry about that. Um, so everyone brings personal stories and rela personal relationships to the play experience, and so um, kind of, you know, recognizing that, acknowledging that, and then bringing them, uh, bringing those those stories and experiences in as part of your creation can be can be super effective. Um, the last thing, and I'll you know I'll brush through this really quickly, is the idea of just letting go. Um, a lot of times we have such expectations from what our art is supposed to be or uh, what we are supposed to be as artists and creatives, and sometimes just letting go of all of that. Um, again, breaking all the rules, reassessing uh, sort of who we are and, and what we want can be the key to sort of gaming the system and, and really finding um, that core value of, of play or creativity. Um, one of the, actually I'll, well, no, this is important, I think. One of the things that I, I first heard at the Game Developers Conference was that um, when, we're, when we're watching play, we should essentially look to see what people are doing and then make that easier. A lot of times we don't know what's going to be fun or what's going to be meaningful or you know what's going to really touch people in a, in a way that's significant. And so sort of leaning into what they're already doing, really listening, be, being a, uh, an observer can help that a lot. Um, another idea is rather than being authors, sometimes we need to be enablers of authorship. So uh, I'm a 
a writer originally, you know, did my English major, and so the idea of creating beautiful narratives in video games is, is super important to me. But uh, more important to me recently has, be, uh, has been the idea of creating spaces where people can, can really express themselves. Um, and creating spaces where they can sort of reconnect to their core values, you know, populate those worlds um, that we create with, with their values. Um, the, the end of it all essentially is that I believe in art. I believe in video games. I believe in, in writing. I believe in creative mornings and spreadsheets. And, you know, I, I believe in all of those things to bring people together. Um, a lot of times in our creative works, we, we focus on conflict. We, uh, you know, when we're writing a story, we, we come up with these grandiose conflicts. When we're making games, we, we build enemies, you know, things like that. Um, the reality is, though, there are very real conflicts that already exist. Uh, things like stigma, things like depression and loneliness and physical illness um, that already exist. Those are conflicts that we can tackle with our art. And the tools that we have to conquer those are you know, vulnerability and visibility and love and connection. And so as we're working through our, sort of through our creative mediums to build those bridges, we'll find that the, the values we place in our creative worlds uh, essentially externalize and become a part of our everyday reality. And that's kind of the dream. Um, again, I, I believe in art, I believe in games, I believe in each of you as creatives. Um, and I believe that, that really art can make us whole, can heal our hearts, can heal our bodies, can heal our relationships. Um, and I'm super excited about that. So uh, again, I'm Greg Bayless. You can find me uh, on the places. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think we'll just take a couple minutes for questions if yeah. people want. Yeah, if, if everyone's available to, sure, if you want to get any questions. Um, yeah, I have a couple. Uh, Mainly about that uh, Cory uh, Fish choreography game. Yeah. So uh, who came up with the idea for it being centered around fish? Was it one of the uh, end users you brought in with you? Was it one of your designers or your researchers? Who was it? Yeah, perfect. So the question was, um, with the choreographer fish game, who came up with the actual idea of having it be centered around fish? Uh, and that was actually one of the things that came directly from the uh, co-designers, the, the kids with Autism Spectrum Disorder. Um, we had originally thought to do a game about flocking birds, um, and, and the kids expressed a much more uh, fervent interest in, in underwater scenes. Um, also, a lot of our research with autism uh, experts um, sort of tied into that. We, we talked about sensory deprivation chambers and the types of colors and lighting atmospheres and things like that that, uh, that they use in sensory deprivation chambers to sort of calm people down who, who uh, you know, are, ha are having sort of panic attacks or things like that. And so we, we brought that together uh, into it as well in terms of color palette and lighting and the, the types of music and things like that. Perfect. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, this is a really specific question, um, but you know, it seems like you work a lot with VR and, and AR. Um, you know, making games that involve the body and physicality, and then having this ephemeral VR space where oh, there's a VR wall there, but oh, I can put my hand through it. I'm just curious if like what challenges you've run into, into there, or solutions you've come up with around those. Yeah, perfect. So the question was uh, with. Uh, sort of working in, in VR so much, uh, what are some of the challenges that I've run into in terms of not actually having haptic physical feedback in these virtual spaces? Um, I mean, it is a real problem and there's lots of really brilliant people working to solve it. Um, you know, I think it really, it really depends on the, on the specific uh, app or game that you're in, but a lot of times the mind is pretty good at um, sort of faking you out. So for example, um, there's a, a VR bike that we sometimes use where you're literally pedaling and that's how you, you move throughout the game. Um, and it's just a stationary bike. It doesn't tilt or anything like that. But um, we'll have you know people come in and, and try it out. These are like hospital executives in their suits and things like that. Um, they hop on thinking they'll be on there for 30 seconds and 15, 20 minutes later they're sweating and um, they're saying, oh, that, that's so cool that it has like built in like tilting stuff and you know, like the, the mind essentially plays all sorts of tricks 
um, to help you buy into those realities. So, um, I mean, we, we would love to have haptic feedback, you know. Um, right now, the technology isn't quite, quite to the level where we would need it to be to create, you know, sort of real experiences. But at the same time, I don't know that, for me personally, like, VR is sort of the first bite, you know. I, I hope that games don't uh, necessarily launch us further into game worlds. I hope they wake us up to the, the things that exist in the real world, you know. And so I'm... On, on, in some ways, I'm disappointed that we don't have better haptic technology, but in other ways, I'm, I'm glad that we don't because it means that we can more fully embrace sort of the, the real world experiences and real interactions with people or, or therapists or, or whatever. Cool, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah. Have you seen, I believe that it's in China or Japan, where they have a really older population and all these people are stuck in homes, they can't move around a whole lot. Um, there was one nurse that takes his 360 camera mm -hmm. with him to places where his patients have been to get back that memory. Oh, interesting. And he'll go to the pyramids if they travel as a kid, or he'll go to the, the park that they used to play at. Just yeah. so that they can um, interact with and feel like they're there with him, and um, their cognitive memory gets like, tenfold, and it's really amazing to be able to witness that. So, not really a question, just. No, that's, that's awesome. So, she, uh, she recounted uh, how there's a, a, I guess, a, a clinician in Japan who uses 360 photography to be able to. Uh, help geriatric patients remember uh, places and people and, and things that they might have forgotten, sort of revisiting those memories through virtual reality and 360 photography. Um, we'll maybe take one more question and then wrap, and if we want to talk about stuff afterwards, I'll stick around for a while as well. Sure. What yeah. advice do you have for designers who are looking to um, expand the mainstream's understanding of things like autism, racial inequality, what it's like to be this or that, you know, helping us understand others better and have empathy for those we normally don't. Uh, what advice would you have for people trying to make games that help to make you do that? Yeah, so the question was, what advice would you have for people trying to uh, sort of, uh, I guess, uh, what was that? Empathy. Yeah, sort of, sort of trying to build empathy for um, for different experiences like autism spectrum disorder or um, or things like that. Uh, I'm going to lean on uh, one of my favorite game scholars. Her, her name is Anna Anthropy, and she has this book called The Rise of the Video Game Zinesters. And she says, you know, for so long people have said video games are violent and sexualized and you know, are, are just about sort of male power fantasies because for so long those have been the only people making games is cis, white, hetero, bro-y, violent dudes, you know? And so she says the way to get more stories out there, the way to um, get more interesting games out there is to get different types of people making games. And so my, my advice to any designer or creator, whether it's in games or or art or writing is to just start making stuff. You know, it doesn't have to be super fancy. I, I learned all of my coding and art from YouTube. Uh, most of it over a, a single summer where I was unemployed. And so, um, you know, it's, it's really about finding, you know, finding yourself in, in your medium, you know, showing up authentically as, as your whole complicated self, you know, not necessarily, um, uh, sort of whitewashing who you are so that you can, uh, so you can be part of a more mainstream audience or, or uh, appeal. Um, but yeah, I think showing up and just being prolific in, in telling your story, that's the important thing. Getting, getting more people in games, uh, or in art or, or writing or whatever. Um, and the thing that we realize is that when we show up, it invites other people to show up as well. And so we see sort of a compounding effect as, as people are, um, you know, sharing their stories and inviting connection and empathy. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you.